Good afternoon to all of you. At the outset, I am, should thank ICTS for giving me this opportunity to deliver a talk on, in memory of uh, Dr. Abdul Salam, a great uh, physicist who has made an impact globally. And it's indeed a great uh, honor to deliver a talk in his memory. And uh, if you look at the people who have given the talk, probably I may not stand anywhere close to the kind of people who have delivered such talks earlier. But anyway, everything is an opportunity. I take this as a good opportunity to talk to you about Indian space program's future. But before we get into the future of the space program, it's important that we look at how the space program in India got developed and where it reached before a significant change that's happening currently and how it's going to move forward. We need to look at that. So I intend to take you through the history a little bit. And of course, all of many of you are quite familiar. It was Dr. Vikram Sarabhai who actually envisioned use of space technology for India's development. And he was actually the one who said, we must be second to none in the application of advanced technologies. Today, we are all familiar with how disruptive technologies change the society, change the way we live in the society. But way back in 1957, when the first object went into space, put into orbit by Russians, India was a fledgling democracy just 10 years into independence. And at that time, India had a huge number of problems to solve, providing food for everybody and developmental activities. And at that time, recognizing that the capability of going to space and using this technology for looking at what's happening on Earth and then providing significant capability of solution was what he, was, what he envisaged. And making use of his friends at America, Russia, France, and Germany, he brought sounding rockets in the form of kits and started working in the country. So this technology of uh, sounding rockets being brought, and in fact, the church, what you see, is the place where the first uh, sounding rocket got assembled and launched. And the activity started with convincing the scientists across the globe that we have a unique geomagnetic equator located near Tumba, and conducting upper atmospheric research there is beneficial for the scientific community. And then what was demonstrated is by making use of the space technology, he convinced Americans that they should allow us to borrow a satellite, what they had built, advanced technology satellite, and moved over to India for one year. And then using that, provide a capability. I'll just run a small video here. Particularly in a country like India, where the large mass of people who have to be motivated are illiterate, it is very important to, I think, have the information uh, input um, as an integral part of the developmental process. And I think a powerful technique like an audiovisual presentation through television uh, can be one of the most important uh, motivations, uh, a catalyst. Produced for this experiment, were broadcast for the first time directly from a satellite to 2,400 villages of six states of India. Corporation, which gave us an old disused part of a municipal school. Don't leave it open. Flies will come. Sleep with mosquito net. Because they say, wash your hands before take your food. Information to the whole work came up. Okay. That was just a glimpse of uh, what was happening. So that experiment which was conducted was the world's largest socio-technological experiment conducted by anybody. Though Americans were building the most advanced technology satellite, India could visualize how this could be used for a developing country to demonstrate to the people who matter that you can quickly bring in communication revolution and broadcasting revolution 
and that's what was done using that experiment. And another very important requirement for the country was the super cyclones, in the presence of super cyclones, we have tens of thousands of people losing their life. And to take care of that, nothing better than making observation from geostationary satellites. And today we have a capability of telling well in advance the location and the time at where the cyclone comes. And as a result of that, today we are able to save tens of thousands of people's lives because disaster relief agencies are able to evacuate the people well in advance. And this is how, the, from 19, 2009 to 13, the kind of accuracy that's improving significantly. Today, you have reached less than 20 kilometers in error and half an hour in time in terms of prediction. Another very important thing that happened using the space technology was bringing in telemedicine and teleeducation network much before what you see today using the broadband communication, terrestrial communication, ISRO demonstrated and linked the people from remote places to super specialty hospitals and schools. And another very interesting aspect was when Dr. Sarabhai had to conduct the experiments of the sounding rockets in that tumba, he had to convince the fishermen using the help of Bishop Peter Bernard Pereira that the fishermen should vacate the place and allow us to conduct that experiment. And one day in future, the country will benefit just as though to demonstrate what was said from 1999 onwards, by looking at the color of the ocean from the satellites and then identifying through that the chlorophyll and through the food chain of the fish, where the fishermen can go for fishing. And today with our Navic satellite, we have gone one step further and a small battery operated gadget is fitted into the boat of the fishermen and using that, an app on the mobile of the, in the hands of the fisherman. He gets video compass mode direction to where he has to go for fishing. And he gets in his mother tongue updates on weather vagaries or if sea state roughness is going to be unbearable or even alerts on if he's approaching international boundaries. So all this it shows how the most advanced technology of a launch vehicle, satellite and its application helps a person who does not know reading or writing live his livelihood. We have more than a million people across the 7,500 kilometer long coastline. Today, using these satellites, you have a number of services, including the railway information system and many basic capabilities which have come for providing very many solutions. And then also you can imagine that the data collected from satellite over many decades served to provide for environmental and climate studies, and this data is available. And today, by virtue of all the observation that you have, multispectral and hyperspectral observation, digital elevation model data collected from satellites, and using the navigation-based system, positioning systems, and using modeling and model techniques, the applications are provided in socioeconomic security, sustainable development, disaster risk reduction, and governance. And the government made use of this capability and brought the information to the both administration of state and central governments of people, and then ensured that the space technology gets into many planning and different uses. And as always, any new technology requires significant amount of effort in convincing the user community that what provisions you have made requires a significant handholding. And then each user community takes its own time before adopting. While some are early adopters, some are late adopters. You can see Forest Survey of India started way back in 87, but then INCOIS in 99, and Airports Authority of India, which provides, I'll show you some of the slides on what it is doing. And then India also made use of these uh, space capability to provide the transponder services to the neighboring countries. And then apart from looking at Earth, India also provided a number of scientific missions where it looked at Moon, Mars, and many of the applications that were possible. And lunar missions, if you look at Chandrayaan-1, 2008, 
though actually man had landed on the moon and a large number of instruments had made observation on the surface of the moon, Chandrayaan-1 gets the credit for discovering the presence of water molecules and the process responsible for water molecule formation and OH molecule formation there. And Chandrayaan-2, which we launched, is a significant improvement over Chandrayaan-1, where all the instruments are specifically designed for extending the capability. And we went ahead with that. And very soon, you will have Chandrayaan-3 coming up. I'm rushing through some of these simply because the basic idea of today's talk is more on what is the future. But before we get into the future, I thought it will also be appropriate to just look at what has happened in the past. And this shows, for example, in Chandrayaan-2, all the different capabilities where we have a dual frequency synthetic aperture radar, first of its kind operating on the moon, in the moon's orbit. Then we also have a very high resolution imaging instrument there. And Mars mission, again, a very unique mission, which made the interplanetary mission conducted with a very, you can say, limited resources, both in terms of launch vehicle capability as well as in terms of monetary effort. And then we also had an AstroSat mission, which carries, even today, the world highest angular resolution in far ultraviolet, and then the most sensitive instrument, as a result of which it's been able to provide virgin data to our research community, and who have already come out with significant results using that. And while doing all this, you also went through a significant amount of international cooperative missions, where we worked with the French for Megatropics and Saral Altica program, which provides the data not only for the Indian community, but also for the global community for ensuring that this happens. <clears throat> See, for doing all this, you needed to develop technological capability, starting from the communication satellite first generation communication satellite procured from Americans, but then subsequently the second generation onwards, all the satellites are built within the country. And from Apple onwards today, you have a broadband connectivity and multi-beam systems providing to the gram panchayats up to 20 megabits capacity. Of course, a lot of this particular thing is still work in progress and many capacities increasing. And another important development that happened is navigation, where Gagan is a system where a, the, an augmented receiver on the aircraft makes use of the GPS satellites, locates itself, and helps in not only en route planning, but also for precision landing. And India came up with a seven satellite constellation, unlike others who are using 24 to 32 satellite constellation for global navigation systems. And then using this, a significant amount of application is happening. Just the other day, we saw one of the companies coming out with a 12 nanometer navigation chip, which can work for Navic. And they're coming out with a huge amount of applications using Navic system. And again, in terms of imaging system, starting with Bhaskara with a one kilometer resolution imaging, Gradually, we built up a capability. And today, you have 30 centimeter imaging providing from LEO platform. And you have a capability to look at what is happening almost every few seconds for limited area to the entire global coverage in a few days. So a host of imaging systems have been developed. And these capabilities are in operation, both in optical and in microwave domains. And for this, these satellite, different types of satellites, both for meteorological applications. Meteorological applications, today you have capability to look at every 15 minutes what is happening over the Indian subcontinent using the InSat series satellite, operating in many wavelengths, optical and micro infrared. And you have a number of uh, low Earth orbiting satellite providing in microwave region the data. And also hyperspectral imaging is another capability where you can look at the region in many different wavelengths at very narrow bands, and using them, you can come up with a large number of applications. And then microwave is another capability where you can Im easily imagine between June and September, India is cloud full of cloud cover, 
and what can you see from space in optical and infrared. But microwave can see through the clouds like we can see through glass. And using these, the microwave instruments, you get opportunity to see what's happening for many of the specific regions for both um, biomass estimation and then rice as well as sugar cane. And then space science again, a series of instruments making use of every opportunity that was available. The way back in 75 when the Aryabhata was launched, that also carried few scientific instrument, X-ray astronomy, aeronomy, and solar physics uh, instruments. And then every opportunity was made use of for putting an instrument and making observations. So science studies have been an integral part of the ISRO's missions. And then again, this shows you a series. And in the coming days, of course, you will have Chandrayaan-3, Aditya, and Exposat, which is going to come in the near future. For doing all this, you also needed to build a technological capability of launch vehicles, launch vehicles starting from solar, mean satellite launch vehicle, ASLV, PSLV, and then GSLV. We have more than 220 plus missions which have gone up, more than 86 launches. And not only have we launched our own satellites, but also 380 plus satellites for 34 other countries. So here what India did was make use of every launch opportunity, if there was any spare capacity, make use of this spare capacity for launching satellites for others. And in terms of the launch vehicle itself, if you look at Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, starting from 1994, every mission was an upgradation of the capability and then continuously enhancing the mission capability. And today, PSLV is considered as one of the very credible launch vehicles and just on 22nd of this month, you are going to have another commercial launch where for Singapore, we are launching a couple of satellites and continuously making sure that the technological capability of the launch vehicle is continuously upgraded. And you can see that this particular satellite launch vehicle can put satellites into different orbits and in the same launch also it can put multiple satellites as well as satellites into multiple orbits. This is one of the unique capabilities. And it also put 104 satellites in one go. At that time, of course, it was a world record. But today, Elon Musk has overtaken that and 130 satellites in one go has been launched. And then in terms of uh, geostationary satellite launch vehicle, this is where another significant capability because it requires cryogenic engine development. And then while one superpower was ready to provide the launch vehicle, the cryo engine capability, but then another superpower ensured that this did not happen. And this was used in a way as a blessing in disguise. And today we have our own GSLV Mark III and GSLV Mark II cryo engine based systems. And you also saw how LVM-3 is made into a commercial venture by launching almost 72 satellites of OneWeb in the recent past. And a large number of tests had to be conducted for ensuring that the cryogenic engine technology capability is done. So continuous development starting from sounding rockets way back in 63 with SLV, then ASLV, PSLV, GSLV, and now we have brought in another version, which is the SSLV. And two of them, the one successful launch has happened and one more is expected shortly. And in all this, making sure that the country's capability in space technology happens all the time, addressing the developmental needs of the country for bringing in infrastructure, in involving academia, and then industry has been the path taken by ISRO. And we are also able to develop a number of uh, chips using the 180 nanometer technology at CMOS Fab at Chandigarh. And then we also make use of a number of uh, computational systems set up across different centers for various applications. And then another key thing that happened is while 
India needed to develop the space technology of the launch vehicle. More than 80% of the actual fabrication of the launch vehicle, even in the earlier times, actually happened in the industry. And this shows you, in a nutshell, how this technological capability is enabled in the country using the industry. And then a large number of uh, material development and indigenous capability, national capacity building, particularly for the ultra high strength steel material, which is one of the backbone, the miraging steel developed in 1982. And then you can see hypersonic wind tunnel facility established and then where large number of tests were conducted, scramjet testing, and these facilities are established in Trivandrum. And then many facilities for doing propellants and chemicals, liquid hydrogen plant at the industry. And then again, this shows a number of uh, different components using, for example, titanium sponge being developed, copper alloy melting facility, and many of them. And then in addition to that, building a multi-object tracking radar for observation, then thermal vacuum facility, vibration facility. India had the highest resolution imaging capability in the world, not in the military domain, but only in civilian domain. Similarly, Mars Orbiter mission demonstrated how you, with limited resources you can do planetary missions. And then AstroSat, again, showing that the Indian academic institutions can build telescopes of very significant capability. Of course, this is just a similar thing, right use of enabling technologies. And this is how all the development took place. And then by this time, of course, the country also in terms of economic strength had developed. So the government wanted that the human space program be done before the 75th year of independence. But then COVID and the financial constant, other uh, availability constraints have pushed it slightly beyond. But work is in progress on this uh, human space mission. And today, this is going to provide a significant capability in the country. I'll touch upon that a little more. See, while we were doing all this from the 60s till 2020, world is also moving ahead. And then today, the it's no longer the only nation states which are conducting space activities. A lot of private entities are also getting into the space business. And as human beings conquered land, ocean, and airspace, now he is looking at conquering space itself. So you are looking at space tourism, space adventure, space habitats, and then going beyond planet Earth is becoming a significant activity. And huge number of private companies are getting into space business. And then just to look at 21 and 22, how things have changed drastically. In 2021 itself, almost 145 orbital launch attempts had happened. And 989 Starlink satellites and 284 OneWeb satellites got launched. And then unprecedented number of spacecrafts were deployed during 2021. 1730 spacecrafts, which is more than 29% from the previous year's version. Similarly, in 22 also, the number further increased into 186 launches, and then USA being the leading launch uh, agency with um, China closely following that. And then even to space station mission, a number of such uh, programs were done. And then they, you had a large number of Starlink satellites which went up, and then SSLV also was part of the new development in the, that year. China launched its first methane-fueled rocket. Then private space agency caught its first stage booster using a helicopter. SpaceX performed first all-private crewed flight to ISS. So world is changing drastically. And you can also see how things are changing. Boom in Earth observation satellite creating new demands for intelligence. Crisis such as COVID pandemic climate change and the war in Ukraine, fueling demand for geospatial information. So one of the companies putting a 14 satellite constellation and then making use of that for looking at the both war as well as in the way 
some of the companies, like for example, how many cars are produced by a company by looking at its parking lots, the number of vehicles parked. Those are the things that are happening. And while weather monitoring also happened to be earlier in the domain of only the nation states conducting activity, today there are private companies looking at building private constellations to provide weather information. And already the first satellite has been launched by one of the companies, and they're coming up with a constellation of 12 more satellites. And more and more constellations are being looked at for providing data using completely private enterprise. So the, and then other applications that are moving is making use of devices that are accessible. See, for example, using mobile as, along with an app as a tool for collecting information of uh, importance for satellite signals and using them for meteorology and space weather patterns, this activity that's going. And obviously, building space technology capability, one of the things, the cost of the launch has to be brought down. And Elon Musk demonstrated in a very significant way how the first stage can be brought back and means put back in a very precise manner and through that process make use of them for relaunching the, the stages and reducing the cost of the satellite launching. And then obviously when more and more objects are in space, the life of a satellite gets exhausted after the fuel you carry in that becomes exhausted. And there are companies which are setting up space stations and then who will go and actually refuel the vehicle, other satellites. And then more and more such companies are already looking at how to build and make them happen. One company is already in operation. And then as the economics of doing that becomes more and more viable, more companies will get into that. Similarly, debris removal is another important development that is required as the space becomes crowded with more and more satellites. People are looking at putting 40,000 satellite constellations or 100,000 satellite constellation. So the satellites, after they become non-functional, what to do with them? So there are companies, again, looking at removing of the debris from the space. And not only that, in-space manufacturing is becoming very important already making 3D printing there. Not only that, after scavenging the material, converting them into usable material for future space activity are all becoming part of the work. And then there are private companies looking at setting up space stations for doing both manufacturing activities as well as for doing even medic medicinal uh, <clears throat> devices and medicines being actually manufactured in space is becoming part of the activity. And not only that, in future, how to harness power from space is also going to be a significant activity from space. And the cost, like I was telling, all these activities become important when the cost of doing that becomes less. And ultimately, it's the economics that drives. And already, you can see significantly cost per kilogram of putting into space is reducing and more and more it is going to come down. When that happens, the whole thing is going to change. There are a few more slides just to change the scenario in a way that in the early 50s and 60s, Americans and Russians were competing with each other. And then for a long time, there was a silence. But now a different race, battle of billionaires who are looking at providing space adventure and then space habitation exercise going on. Space tourism is catching up in a big way. Already a lot, you are seeing many people are providing, even those who need not undergo training going to space will become a reality. And then mining of celestial bodies of, for getting very important resources from space, again, is an opportunity. Then lunar colony. While all this happened, so what the government saw is in India, while India was among the few countries in the world which developed the end-to-end -end capability of launch vehicles, satellite, and applications, and building, then 
we have today about 50 satellites in operation. But then the capability is demonstrated, but what is needed is capacity. Today, as the, with the kind of neighbors we have, and uh, the various space-based activities that are needed, we may require probably 200 plus satellites providing us capability in all communication, navigation, earth observation, and all that. So one of the thing, and another thing is, in space economy, as you have seen, more and more private entities are entering into the space economy and is expected to reach a trillion dollar very soon. And if India, which has a demonstrated capability of space technology, should it not get a significant pie in that? That was the government's thinking process. So if it has to happen, it, while the government itself may not be able to pump in large amount of money, it wants to enable the private enterprise and more people to participate in that. To make it happen, India brought in space reforms. And this is where the sector, space sector reforms, which came up unlocking India's potential in space sector, going from the demand-based approach we were using our New Space India Limited and in space. I'll show you some details of what is being looked at in this particular case. See, if the global market share of India's share is just about 2%, and if it has to go to something like by 2025, it has to reach up to $50 billion, that is the thought process. And if that has to happen, significant change in the way the activity is going on in the country needs to be done. So what the government has done is it has set up in space which will facilitate private sector participation. Government has created the Indian National Space Promotion and Authorization Center, which is a single window independent nodal agency and a department of space. And then it will promote and enhance the role of non-government entities, which will authorize the use of many of the ISRO facilities for, by private companies. And then it will enable provide looking at Reg regulatory environment, policy environment, and then enabling the private sector also to participate in all activities of remote sensing, satellite communication, navigation, technology transfer, space transportation, all of them. And then the guiding principles of the reforms itself is opening up of the ISRO infrastructure and facilities that reforms aims to make na national space infrastructure which has been established, which I showed you many of them. Each one of them requires significant amount of funding. And by enabling the private entities to use them, significant reduction in the developmental time scale is being attempted. And then testing, tracking, and then providing the telemetry and other facilities also. And then enabling and promoting non-governmental entities to carry out this and then public sector to enable the transfer of technology to industry. More than 100 technologies have been announced, and it's going on. And ISRO is also looking at bringing out many new programs. One is what is called a Yo Vignani Karyakram, and then inspire youngsters and dreamers, space tutors, and then Unnati program, which is a nano satellite assembly and training by ISRO, and then Implementation of the SAT strategies, for example, the opening up the space track sector. And then this again, in a, in a nutshell, what is being attempted to provide to the Indian community. And already we are seeing the impact of the reforms. And you can see that industries, startups, and academia have warmly welcomed the space sector reforms. And then more than 150 proposals have been considered by InSpace, and they are now supporting them. And then PSLV productionization. Already, HAL, along with LNT, is going to produce five PSLVs. And very soon, all the new launch, the vehicles, launch vehicles, whether it is PSLV or GSLV, Mark III, or even SSLV, will all be done in the Indian industry. And then Human resource development, of course, is a very important aspect. And capacity building commission is also working with ISRO on doing these activities. And then you can see 
that in one web we already put in the last six months 72 satellites of one web company has been actually launched. In fact, you can see here how quickly India was able to take advantage of an opportunity in the in Ukraine-Russia war. Satellites were sitting on the launch vehicle ready to be launched, but then because of the war, Russians were not going to launch the satellites and OneWeb was looking for an alternate. And one of our new launch vehicles, which had not been used for a, putting multiple satellites into orbit, was tweaked, and we were able to put 72 satellites successfully into commercial, on a commercial basis. So this is one of the things that happened. And already a private company has launched its first stage, and then they call it as Mission Praram. And this is Skyroot Aerospace has done this. And another company which is actually setting up a facility in um, Shar and also a 3D printed engine, they are testing Agnicool. So you can see a significant amount of uh, privatization is already taking shape. And we also did recently RLV Lex mission. See our own effort to ensure that the cost of launching comes down. Of course, these are all still at the very preliminary stage. So successfully demonstrating the safe landing after releasing from one of the helicopters was demonstrated a few weeks back. And of course, if you just look at immediate future, what is going to happen, ISRO is working with NASA for a mission called NASA ISRO Synthetic Aperture Radar and this is the already the payload has reached Bangalore. It's getting integrated with the satellite and the integration and all the other tests will be completed during the course of this year. And earlier next year, this is going to be launched. You will be happy to know that the simulation and system providing the simulated data for this mission is being done using a payload which is very similar to our Chandrayaan-2 SAR, l and s band SAR, and that instrument flown on an American aircraft in North America and India. It's collecting data to provide simulation images for this. And Aditya L1 is again getting ready and we are going through a series of mission readiness discussions coming week. And this one is going to provide a unique opportunity of a satellite being at a Lagrange point looking at sun 24 by 7 and providing a unique observational capability. And then national collaboration, engaging all the various institutions and various ground agencies across the disciplines is part of the effort that is being done. And particular, this also you can see the system demonstration model is ready. And uh, this year and early next year, there'll be all preparatory tests conducted for human space mission. And a large number of tests are expected to be conducted towards this. And this will also provide platform for a number of uh, microgravity experiments. And here again, we are making use of not only these platforms, but also the spent stage of PSLV for conducting many microgravity experiments. And then, like I said, uh, next, the, later this week, this mission is going to get launched. Of course, this is one of the images from our OceanSat, which is now able to take the image of the total globe. And then I'll end my talk with a couple of uh, quotes from Dr. Sarabhai. The important ingredient for satisfactorily meeting the challenge of the changing environment is not experience, but an ability to learn. Experience is less relevant than knowledge and the ability to learn and innovate. And then technology is not an objective to be aimed at, but a tool to be used for the benefit of common man. And then Sarabhai's vision on the development of space technology and its extensive use. So while in the earlier era, we, the space, Department of Space was doing exclusively the activities. Now Department of Space is looking at 
providing to the entire country whatever technological capability that has been developed, enabling and empowering more and more participants, and through that, India becoming a significant player in the coming days in the space economy. And what is expected in future is the more and more private entities getting into that and feeding into the India's economy as space economy itself is like we talked about, a trillion dollar economy. And we are looking at reaching 10 to 20% of that through what is happening in the country. That is where the space technology in India is heading. Thank you very much for the patient hearing, and I'll be more than happy to take any questions. Any questions? Thank you very much, uh, Shrikrit Kumar, for giving this very nice vision of the future of the Indian space program. Do you have some time to take questions? Sure. Okay. So if you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand. Uh, one of our volunteers will bring a mic to you. Recently, there was a news item on reusable launch vehicles, and uh, you also mentioned that. Uh, can you please tell us how will it really works and what is the reusable part in that? Okay, so what we are doing in the reusable launch vehicle is for an orbiting component coming back and landing, and then the orbital component to be used again and again. So that is the one what we have done both in terms of the recent experiment of landing on a runway. So this is, an, later what will happen is you will have an element which is putting things into space, orbit, and then from orbit it will come back, enter atmosphere, and get in. So that is the version what we have attempted. But others have attempted even the first stage also being um, brought back, and in fact, Elon Musk has already demonstrated and used it multiple times. Already he has used stages. But our own launch vehicle first stage, the significant component is a solid motor, and that is not amenable for reusability, because even if you bring back, what you get is only the casing. Whereas liquid engine-based systems, we are working on semi-cryo engines, which will be even Mark III, LVM III, will have semi-cryo-based uh, component. And those things, the advantage will be when you get back, you can refuel and use them again. So the whole idea is to use multiple times the entire engine by simply refueling and refurbishing. So the cost of that particular component comes down. And it's expected that cost could come down as much as a factor of 10 in its ultimate uh, final stage. Uh, can something be, you talked about uh, space debris, which is actually increasing every day. Can something be done to, to use this uh, re-entry re technique for the space, the satellites at the end of their life, somehow to come back to enter the Earth's atmosphere and crash there instead of moving around in space? Yeah. See, today, one of the things which by virtue of uh, discussion among the space agencies, etc. What is being done is all the satellites, this is not man, means it, there is no regulation, but like a practice, good practice. See, earlier the rocket stages, spent stages, did not carry any system for ensuring that they were not causing problem. But now all low Earth orbiting satellites are looking at mechanism being retained in the vehicle satellite so that at the end of their functional life, they deliberately bring down their orbit and burn while re-entering the atmosphere. But that also is not going to work for higher altitudes or higher orbit satellites. So finally, what will really actually happen is there are companies looking at scavenging. That means taking things and then capturing them, using that material for, again, building something. But in all this, what is really important to understand is it's the economics of doing this that rules the roost. So until the cost of doing that becomes viable, the, many of these will be only ideas and then few attempts made. And only when the real economics works, people will adopt. Like we said already, some companies are building space stations for refueling. 
So the, and then there are also many other aspects today. The act of going close to a satellite cap means refueling also enables another satellite to be captured, etc. You can imagine a host of application why such technologies are developed. But then space is a frontier where more and more now governments are looking at how space can be used for many other activities. But coming back to your basic question, today there are solutions being tried out as R&D activities, but nothing concrete which will solve the problem of uh, whatever debris that is going to happen. So what is going to happen in future, we have to wait and watch. Thank you, sir. Yes, um, thank you very much for this nice talk. I was wondering, so the previous, pres uh, the previous president of the United States introduced with a bit of pomp the Space Force. Uh, I was wondering your opinion about uh, that and, and what do you see the future for India but also the, the world for these kinds of uh, forces? Yeah, um, I think what we have seen across from the past Every new capability that researchers and scientists and technologies come up with, every new capability in the hands of those who want to use it for domination, they use it. There are others who look at using those capabilities for bringing in benefits, mitigating problems, etc. So this is a continuous conflict. I don't think we have an answer to the situation that will emerge. Space, by virtue of the way it is developing with more and more private companies entering, already you have seen even those countries which do not have any space activity giving licenses to companies for going and actually mining on asteroids and appropriating the thing. So what is likely to happen is still those who build the capability will dominate. That's what I feel. Is this a, a concern that uh, how it's the space like, so is there any worldwide effort to somehow no, this regulate effort this? No, this is all the time there. See, today, for example, International Astronautical Congress, which brings in all the space pairing nations. But then, you know, the UN COPUS, for example, the Committee on Outer Spaces, uh, Peaceful Users of Outer Space. This is a committee which started almost 50 years of existence. So all the time, Various entities talk about it, try to do some things. But then finally what happens is determined by few who have the capability to do those things. Yeah. So then how they deal with things is not in the hands of others. So normally what happens, you can say, is if you want to be part of that discussion team, you should build capability. Yeah. So as long as you build a capability, you are also among those who can discuss. But otherwise, you have to, and this is what has happened in the history of humanity, yeah. <laughs> whether right from the early days. And it's not likely to change in any near future. <laughs> While a lot of discussions do happen, efforts are there, but then they have their limited yeah. scope is what I believe. Hello, sir. Uh, no, thank yes. you very much. Uh, I was just curious, uh, in the science-based missions uh, that you mentioned, uh, uh, of course, scientifically, a lot of very interesting things from Aditya and others we can expect. Uh, but uh, it, uh, I was curious whether ISRO, uh, uh, the, in developing the technologies, also has, uh, are there any stories you might like to share which we, uh, where the technologies developed for the science-based missions have been proved to be useful for other uh, aspects of? Yeah, one of the things probably what you would like to look at is in the changing scenario, for example, the, the in terms of space capability, if you look at, one is an orbiting element, lander, then sample retriever. So right now, in Chandrayaan-3, we'll probably demonstrate lander and then in-situ observation. But then the next real capability should be bringing the sample back and then doing in-space station more activity, et cetera. 
which will all a natural consequence of whatever human space program in terms of space station and in terms of other capabilities now we have a task because the way the government is looking at the way things are changing the even department also has now trying to work out mechanisms by which pure technological capability demonstration what demonstrations have to be done and how those demonstration also provide scientific interest to the larger community and through that actually bring in appropriate funding from the government so these are our tasks which uh, like what he was mentioning the board scientific advisory board which is there now we are expected to work among the scientific community and in terms of technological capability going to venus and going to further far away missions etc some work is in progress and then when they will be actually approved and then they take into come into position still at this point is not very clear but then the real issue is we need to develop this ability to bring in synergy and then take it to the government that we need to go ahead because government is now looking at more and more even for the science activity that some of the thing they are looking at is can private entities do it on their own so they are looking at private companies doing missions for space science activities also so it's a challenge for us to deal with hello sir sir my question is that you have just mentioned that uh, many countries are looking for the uh, mining of asteroids or uh, the same things like that so what is the india stand towards that like uh, we have uh, many common asteroids in our galaxy that is uh, namely 16 psyche that is very uh, rarest in the matter minerals that is 95% of the minerals only which is rarest of the rare on earth so the countries like us and china are already have prepared some satellites uh, and some vehicles uh, tools the to mine on that so what is the india stand towards the activities like that and okay okay see that's what i was just mentioning so it's a capability you need to build and demonstrate and obviously a mission like that also once it has to be conceived and then you have to get the approval and then funding for that at this point of time they it's still you can say only a study because right now we are still addressing the issues of beyond our current missions how to go ahead with the remaining ongoing missions etc but in terms of technological capability it's always been endeavor to build sample return missions is what is necessary for doing what you are talking about mining from asteroid so that is beyond the uh, rover mission of chandrayaan 3 that will be the next real technological capability demonstration target but it's still on the drawing boards we do not have any concrete plan as of now and sir uh, the countries like us and china has china and russia has already their space stations on the uh, in the space uh, from several years ago so uh, has india any vision for the uh, upcoming 5 or 10 years to uh, create any or uh, means uh, smaller bigger space stations yeah see obviously when the government has decided to go for a human space program see it is not with the intention of just putting a couple of gaganauts into orbit and bringing them back and closing so the long term is having space stations and sustainable life beyond earth etc so it's a long term plan but how it evolves we have to wait and see but definitely the mission is not going to end with just couple of gaganauts going into orbit and then coming back so it's definitely the all this currently the government is looking at stabilizing the immediate vicinity how things are happening and then long term visions are in the process of uh, formulating and then getting approval because many of them require significant amount of resources and the government is obviously we are today the fifth largest economy looking towards going to reach the first position so all this become part of that development so you will definitely see things happening but at this point of time i am in no position to tell what is going to happen in the immediate future
So, so maybe now we can uh, give an opportunity to someone else. Oh, okay. Thanks. Uh, hi. Sir, thank you for the lovely talk. I just have a very hypothetical question. Uh, how far away do you think we are from, um, you know, launching a satellite or something that goes beyond our solar system with without having the technology to already uh, explore other planets? Let's say you only have a... 3D printer on it and an artificial intelligence system capable and to figure it out in the time that it will take to reach that other planet. Figure out somehow how to, uh, you know, build a, an appropriate system that can, on the way, increase the efficiency, on the way, uh, you know, make new devices. Like, instead of relying on de developing the technology here and then sending something out just to, let's say, save time. Yeah. Uh, like just say you already have, instead of sending a human, you're, you have an intelligent system, enough to adapt along the way. Uh, like this is starting from when you said there's already adaptable technology, right? We don't uh, necessarily need to rely on ground-based things to repair what's in, this, what's in space. I'm basically making what is in space more autonomous. Uh, how uh, realistic do you think that is? And uh, no. if so, should we just launch something now and like... Let's just hope it works out. No, no, you have a very interesting question. See, one of the things today, and people are looking at propulsion itself, if you take mm -hmm. the today technological capability that is there in terms of what speeds you can generate, what accelerations you can do. You can reach Mars in 10 months now. Already people are looking at 10 days and maybe even less, etc. But in all that, primary thing is the fuel what you require for your travel. Right. If that fuel you have to carry from ground launch, obviously it's going to be huge and it's going to be a deterrent. That means you should be able to pick up material or Along the way, en route yeah. Yeah. and then use that for propelling yourself. So there are some thoughts, etc. which, for example, people talk about how to extract from the nothingness the, for the few fractions of maybe whatever uh, fractions of seconds, huh, can... some material pops up. Can you capture them okay. and then use them for accumulating and use them as material for propagation or also propulsion, etc. Also to et recognize gravitational uh, catapults yeah. along the way, right? Not no, just gravitational material. catapult thing. That is all for that you require. For example, already the, the systems are built, but for mm -hmm. that to do that, you need to start with what you have. But what you are looking at is, can we get something on the way and use it for actually doing the job of traveling? Yeah. That is a real challenge. And this is where a lot of new technology has to come up. Today, there is, these are only thought processes. If you can pick up something on the way, so what is that something, how it comes, and for how much fraction of a time when it is there, can you capture it and retain it and use it Today, people are talking about propellantless propulsion. Some work has happened, but then it is not adequate. And your other question, going beyond, only other way was nuclear-powered thing. So those kinds of things. But then beyond that, if you have to look at, people really have to come up with a technology of picking up something from vacuum or shunya. <laughs> not vacuum, better thing to call is nothingness. <laughs> because even in vacuum, People have now started telling it is not really in vacuum. There is something which you can call as nothingness, etc. So anyway, it's a challenge. Maybe you can come up with some ideas people can work in for in the future. Okay. But obviously, you. though that is the way in which it will go. Otherwise, no known technology today can take you beyond solar system itself. Thank you. Okay. Sir. Thank you. I, I will maybe take the opportunity. Is there a last one? Uh, thank you, sir, for the lovely talk. Also, I had a question based on what is your opinion on what is more beneficial, uh, having privatized space exploration or government-based space exploration? I think so what the options think? are very little. If you want the government to spend, the government should have money and it should be able to provide. And another thing is, if you look at globally also, there are already significant, see, it is no longer, the space is no longer operated only by the nation states. The private companies are already into it in a big way. So why should government of India deprive other Indians of such an opportunity? 
And then what government should do? Obviously, it should still make sure that it should do all those things which enable the country to take advantage of new capabilities and work towards areas where the private enterprise may not look at at that point of time. So identifying such things and then keeping the capability development should be one of the things. But then here, that also requires significant amount of resources. And what we are anticipating is, as the economic strength of the country grows, all this naturally will happen. But then for that, we also need bright, innovative minds who can take advantage of what is happening globally, come up with new ways of performing the activities, and then take us forward. Perhaps Thanks, I can so. take the, the uh, you have uh, yes, a time limit, yeah. I, I believe. Uh, yeah, five thirty. Yes, so so I'll maybe I'll, I'll take the opportunity to take the last ask the last question. So, uh, how well does how, how this interface between the academia and um, ISRO worked in India? And if you especially compare with more developed countries like US or Europe, uh, is there a way of just like there is this uh, new effort to opening up the space industry for private players, is there a way to sort of enhance the uh, collaboration between academia and the space agency for uh, scientific exploration? Yeah, if you look at the ISRO, Professor Satish Dhawan, who is actually credited with the architect of Indian space program, he was an academician himself. So. He did bring in a lot of academic activities, interacting, etc. But then, over a period of time, things uh, did not come up to the expectations of both. Probably what academia expected and what ISRO expected. There were some shortfalls. But now, if you look at, we do not have too much of an option. See, already, just yesterday, I was in a place where one of the companies, private, no, not company, private entities, Hindustan University, they have set up already a ground station and they're receiving and they have tied up with sky routes and they are already doing actually memorandum of understanding with all the startup companies in India. And IIT Indore is setting up astronomy, astrophysics and space engineering. So now in the country with the new education policy also making sure that you have more and more experiential learning becoming a necessity. The tying up with the startups, et cetera, is happening. So the situation is ripe for more proactive working from both sides. The, while the environment is conducive, what happens depends on the players, how the players actually participate. So today, what we are expecting is definitely both the academia, industry, and the government will work together to enable the country to go forward in a big way. And there are no set paths, there are no trodden paths. If you, it's not fair to compare with what happened with the Western world for the simple reason that in the Western world, for decades, government had put su sufficient amount of money for research. So whereas in the country, it is just did not have that kind of uh, opportunity. It's only now it's changing. So probably you have to look for models which are very different. Okay, so thank you very much. Let's uh, stop with this more positive note. Thank you.